It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher, and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. The United States of America has just now promised Lebanon $50 million. That is like giving $50 million to Hezbollah. It's just like giving $50 million to the Taliban after 9-11. We've retreated from this war. We're acting like the Roman Empire before it, before it fell apart. You don't buy off your enemy. You blow them off the face of the earth. And here we are trying to buy off terrorists. Oh, they can say, well, it's a Lebanese government, but they're terrorists. They hate Israel. The whole Middle East is filled with terrorists. And they all have the same mentality. They might not all be so eager to blow themselves up, but they all have the same mentality. Kill Jews and kill Americans. They're all under the same satanic concept. It would be nearly a miracle to find an Arab in the Middle East that doesn't think in terms of anti-Semitism and anti-Western thought. It just barely exists, if at all. There may be a few believers in that area who haven't gone in that direction that we don't know about. But for 99.999% of the Arab world, they hate Israel and they hate us. And we're not going to be able to buy them off. We're at war, but we don't understand war and we don't understand how to fight it because of Satan's propaganda. Satan's propaganda machine has been cranked up and we're falling right into his trap. Now, as part of our study of the angelic conflict, it's the fact that we must understand that there is actually an angelic observation of the human race, something we already know, but still it should be part of our study since we're talking about Satan and the elect angels. So in order for there to be fairness in court, which is we were talking about court last night, so in order for there to be fairness in court, all angelic creatures have been allowed to come into the court and observe you. Both elect and fallen angels have been allowed to come into court and observe you. Just as you can walk into any court and observe a trial. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, I guess in most cases. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this, actually turn there, 1 Timothy 3.16. This explains that angels watch us. And by consent of all, great is the mystery, mysterion doctrine, of the spiritual life the unique one, Jesus Christ, who became visible by means of the flesh, hypostatic union. This same one was vindicated by agency of the Spirit. That is, God the Holy Spirit sustained him on the cross. He was observed by angels. Angels watched him, both elect and fallen. He was proclaimed among the Gentiles. He became the object of faith in the world. He was taken up into the place of glory. Also, let's look at 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Now that shows us that our Lord was watched when he was in hypostatic union. The great power experiment of the hypostatic union was watched by angels. Furthermore, we, as part of the great power experiment of the church age, we are watched by angels. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. 1 Corinthians 4.9 says, 
For I think that God has exhibited us apostles, last of all, as men condemned to death, because we have become a spectacle in the arena of life to the entire universe, to angels, and to mankind. Angels watched the apostles. They were a spectacle. And by the way, the pastor teacher has the same authority as an apostle. Some people will never grasp onto that and understand it. I'll go no further, although it's tempting. Mm -hmm. Paul is referring to the end. What he's referring to here is the end of a gladiator show in which the gladiators became a spectacle. And that is the greatest gladiators fought and were killed. And the Romans loved violence, and they loved to watch the gladiators fight, and it went on and on all day long until the best, and the best were saved for last, the best battles were saved for last. So Paul is comparing the spiritual battles that the apostles are waging with that of the gladiators. And he's saying, I've been, we've been saved for last, us apostles, as a spectacle, so that angels can watch us and mankind can watch too. Let's look at 1 Timothy 5.21 Also referring to the fact that we are observed by angels 1 Timothy 5.21 I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus and his elect angels, meaning they're watching, to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in partiality. Paul was telling Timothy here not to treat people in partiality in that when people are running you over and pushing you around, don't let them malign you. And he actually at one point had to tell him, don't let them malign you because of your youth, not spiritual youth. He was a young pastor. And so he told Timothy, get some backbone about you. And when you have a backbone, do nothing with partiality. Make sure you're making the right choice. Let's look at 1 Peter 1.12. 1 Peter 1.12. 1 Peter 1.12 also talks about the fact that we are observed by angels. 1 Peter 1.12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel, to you by agency of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels bend down to get a clear look, or actually a better way to say it, they crane their necks to look down and get a look at us, and watch our spiritual lives and listen to pastors when they speak especially the good ones and they listen to doctrine and they watch and they observe Luke 15:10 Luke 15:10 Luke 15:10 tells us something about angels and that is well, it doesn't really tell us that. I was going to say it tell us that it tells us that angels may have emotion. The fact that they clap indicates that angels may have been given emotion. We do know that God, the Son, or God the Father, God the Holy Spirit do not have emotion. We know that God the Son does not have emotion in deity. However, he did have emotion in humanity. But the fact that angels stand up and cheer is an indication they might have emotional response. Luke 15.10 In the same way I tell you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God these are the elect angels over one sinner who changes his mind changes his mind about what? Christ and every time someone believes in Christ the angels cheer and since that occurs probably every day the angels are, and the angels are having a blast because the nail is already in the coffin of Satan. It's already finished for Satan. 
And this just, just, every time someone believes in Christ, he puts another nail in the coffin, and another nail, and another nail. So every time it happens, angels stand up and cheer. Every time one gets to maturity, angels stand up and cheer. Phenomenal thing that occurs. So we do know that we are observed by angelic creatures, both elect and fallen. And there is a spiritual battle that we are engaged in. Now we note the rulership of the devil. The rulership of the devil. First of all, Satan rules, rules all the fallen angels. Number one, Satan rules all fallen angels. Number two, Satan has greater power than any human and he rules the world through his cosmic system. Satan has greater power than any human being, and he rules the world through his cosmic system. Since the fall of Adam, Satan has been the ruler of the world. We've noted those passages in the past. Luke 4, 5 through 7, John 12, 31, John 14, 30, John 16, 11, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Ephesians 2, 2, all of which we've went over in the past and are probably in your notes. So Satan has great power and is now the ruler of the world and has been since Adam and Eve fell. Number three, the devil rules all unbelievers through either demon possession or demon influence. The devil rules all, under, uh, all unbelievers through demon possession or demon influence. Of course, they're always under the cosmic system. They cannot break from it because they don't have rebound. So the devil rules all unbelievers. They do have one category of truth where they can be a, an unbeliever that is outside of reversionism. But that's it for them. The first category of truth, divine establishment. Number four. The devil rules certain believers through demon influence. Actually many believers, not just certain. Point four. The devil rules many believers through demon influence, not demon possession. No believer can be demon-possessed. The involvement of the believer in the cosmic system results in demon influence. And they begin to act just as unbelievers. They begin to think just like unbelievers. They worry just like unbelievers. They have anxiety just like unbelievers. And I'm talking constant. Constant worry. Constant anxiety. Constant sin. And you can't tell a difference between an unbeliever in the cosmic system and a believer in the cosmic system. Negative volition in the soul creates a vacuum called matiotes which we've studied and that will suck the doctrine of demons into your stream of consciousness and create garbage in your stream of consciousness to the point where there's so much scar tissue you may never recover. Point five. Due to the great power experiment of the hypostatic union Due to the great power experiment of the hypostatic union, that is the prototype spiritual life, due to that, and the fact that it's overflowed into the church age, into the protocol, or the great power experiment of the church age, the protocol spiritual life, due to this, the body of Christ is ruled by the head. We've noted that in scripture before. That means the body of Christ is ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. The body of Christ, winner or loser, is ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. You've received a delegated power to resist the devil. As per 1 John 4.4. 4. 1 John 4.4 4 is a promise to claim. Because we've noted about all the powers of Satan. And when it comes down to it, as you, for you as believers, there's a wall of fire around you. And if you've gone to play Roma, there's a double fire, wall of fire around you. Satan's not going to get to you. First uh, John 4.4 4 says so. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. He who is in the world is Satan. The power of Satan as the ruler of the cosmic system. Greater is he who is in you. This is referring to the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit. The fact that you are residing in the divine dinosphere or your unique spiritual life the divine power sphere, the fact that you're filled with the Spirit, the fact that you're under the divine omnipotence of God, the Holy Spirit, means that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Therefore, whatever's going on in the world should not disturb one of us. 
Oh, it's going nuts out there, but we should not be disturbed at all. We might wake up one morning to something very, very disturbing that's happened to our country. It shouldn't disturb you. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And we understand that even though Satan is the ruler of the world, Jesus Christ controls history. And we have to understand that the remnant is always protected, even if there's not enough remnant to save this country. That's why I've gone to double sessions. We need a remnant quick and fast. It doesn't matter if it's just a few either. That can make a whole big difference. That can make a lot of difference. Just a few people can hold back the storm clouds of the fifth cycle of just discipline. Just a few. I'm talking about just a few in this area. Five or six. Just enough. Maybe to hold back the storm clouds. If not, remember, you as part of the remnant will be spared as part of a promise from God. So as the ruler of this world, Satan has two designations since his fall. First of all, these are the two designations of uh, Satan. First of all, originally, number one, originally Satan was called Lucifer. That means the son of light. Lucifer. Satan was originally called Lucifer, the son of light. He was the bright and shining angel in the throne room of God. He was the highest ranking creature of all time. Satan was the highest ranking, most powerful creature. I'm talking about creature. Of course, God is the all-powerful, but God created him as the highest ranking most powerful creature of all time. And did that power make him happy? Did all the approbation lust that he received from all the other angels make him happy? No. He needed more and more and more. So much so that he said, I will make myself like the Most High God. So he was the bright and shining angel in the throne room, throne room of God, the highest ranking creature of all time, the most beautiful and attractive creature of all time, in both appearance, the ladies will go for appearance just like a man will, but not only in appearance but in personality. The personality of Satan is suave, and he can carry on a conversation with anyone very personable till you cross him of course but Satan very personable very suave the greatest personality the greatest looks ever once the second designation this is after the fall of Satan once his fall occurred in prehistoric times before even mankind was created Satan was called Satan in the Hebrew spelled the same way. Satan in the Hebrew, and that means enemy and adversary. Enemy and adversary having greater powers than all of us. But we always must remember that Satan's power is never greater than God's power, a very basic principle all of us know. So this always reminds us of God's grace. He has made available to us His power. You might start to get a bit worried about Satan's power, but God has provided to us His power. And as humans, even though we are inferior, we are an inferior yet rational creation. You could look, the angels could look down at us like we would look down at a dog, except there's one difference: a dog is not rational. He can't. It doesn't. He doesn't think in terms of rationality. Instinct is the way animals go. But for humans, we are rational, inferior, but rational, a rational creation. All angels are superior to us. Satan is the archon, A-R-C-H-O-N. That means the ruler of all angels, who, whose power, therefore, is far greater than our power. Yet we have the availability of divine power, the omnipotence of God the Father, which has given to us our portfolio of invisible assets, the, the omnipotence of God the Son, which has given to us the fact that we know He controls history, the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit, 
which has given to us the fact that we can live inside the divine power sphere, the divine dinosphere, our unique spiritual life. And that is what God has made available to each church age believer. His power! And it's something that's never existed before. In the Old Testament, they did not have as much power as we do as church age believers. Thus, Satan has a greater hate for us than he ever did for an Old Testament saint. Because God has given us grace upon grace. And again, I tell you, we have the omnipotence of God the Father in the fact that he's given us a portfolio of invisible assets. We have the omnipotence of God the Son who, uh, who um, uh, preserves the human race, who controls history, and who preserves the planet Earth daily. Al Gore says that in about nine years there will be no more planet Earth. Al Gore is out in cosmic system la-la land and probably a believer. But he's out there believing the cosmic system. Just as an example. Many people believe that though, not just Al Gore. Many people fall for that stupidity. And they do this without understanding the omnipotence of the Son of God. He holds the universe together. He makes the world spin. He makes it so the sun rises at a certain time and sets at a certain time. He makes the tides come in and go out. He does that. Scientists will say it's nature. It's just something nature did. No, God does it, and God could change it just like that if he wanted to from his sovereignty. There is no rules of nature. They are the rules of God, and God stands by his rules. So in the morning, the sun will rise. If the resurrection occurs, we won't be here, but in the morning, the sun will still rise. And that's the omnipotence of God the Son that does that. Then we have the omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit which gives us this great power of the spiritual life so we can live inside the divine power sphere and we have a power greater than that of Satan we're inferior to Satan but God's given us a power greater than Satan that's why he flees from us when we use the power sphere he actually flees from us almost as if he flees from us in fear the way it's stated it's absolutely amazing to know that the greatest creature ever created from the hand of God he'll flee from us when we utilize the invisible power he's given to us and most believers don't understand that invisible power therefore our country is in trouble our country's been in trouble for years but now the zit is about to pop and we are about to go under quickly like the Titanic so even for the unbeliever, God in his grace has one area of truth, and that's called divine establishment, which we've noted. Satan's second name in the Greek is called Diabolos. I think that's what the Spaniards call him. Diabolos, or the Mexicans. What do they call him? Diablos. Diablos. Well, that's where they get it from. That's D-I-A-B-O-L-O-S. Diabolos. The Greek word Diabolos is... This means slanderer. Slanderer. Remember the composites of Satan. Deception. Slanderer. Vituperator. Hatred and violence. So one of the functions of the devil as the ruler of this world is to express his antagonism, his slander, and his enmity just as people do. Many people, believers, follow in his footsteps. And he does this from a position, however, of great beauty and attractiveness. Satan is an antagonist, a slanderer, and, and one who creates enmity, but he does this from a position of great beauty and attractiveness. By application, just because you run across an attractive person doesn't mean anything. They may be so involved in evil you don't even know about it. Yet daffy little young women will come across some handsome man and fall all over themselves without knowing their souls. And a lot of these daffy young women get married to these men without knowing their souls. And so these very attractive men who have great personalities turn out to be jerks. 
and then they blame God for it. You were just naive, woman. And if Satan were to walk in here, all the naive women would gloat over his beauty, attractiveness, his beautiful voice, etc. That's the superficial. And Satan got so puffed up about the superficial, he said, I'll be like the Most High God. You know what Satan had? I'll go off script for a moment. He had something that uh, I learned in psychology. Not in college, but in working for a place of psychology. He had a... Let's see. Let me get this right. There's two forms of it. A stands for attention. Actually, I have it in my notes later on. can't believe I forgot that. I just wrote it down. I thought about it last night. That's it. ASB ASD Satan had attention seeking behavior which later became an att attention seeking disorder. Psychotic people go into an attention seeking disorder just as Satan and Satan is no doubt psychotic in every sense of the word he's psychotic. He's smart, he's a genius, he's beautiful, he has the voice of a pipe organ, but he's nuts! Psycho! Attention-seeking behavior. Why did he say to himself, I want to be like the Most High God? Attention. Why else would he want to do that? Well, power too. But with power comes attention. Approbation lust. Satan was the first to commit that sin. And he said, I want attention. And he got attention from a third of the angels. And a third of the angels praised Satan and said, I'll go with you. I believe you will be like the Most High God. I mean, look at you. You have the voice of a pipe organ. You are absolutely so beautiful and so phenomenal. How can you not be higher than the Most High God? Or the same as. So... He had attention-seeking behavior. And then that turned into an attention-seeking disorder. And so he goes throughout the world seeking attention through his cosmic system. And he loves it when believers get into his system. Because whether they know it or not, they're giving attention to Satan, whether they know it or not. He loves it. Now, by way of application, you can go the same route. Attention-seeking behavior. How do you do that? Well, it's it. We all start with that when we're young children. What do we say? Look, mommy, no hands. Look, mommy, no feet. Look, mommy, no teeth. Attention-seeking behavior. It's all part of the old sin nature, and of course, little children are expected to do that. They want attention from their parents, and they go into attention-seeking behavior that oftentimes is not very safe at all. They do it anyway. Look, I can tie my shoe. Give me some attention. Pat me on the back. But when you carry that into adulthood, when you believe in Christ and carry it into adulthood, that becomes a serious problem. That becomes a blockage in your soul. That's arrogance. Attention-seeking behavior is arrogance. Some people think they have the gift of pastor-teacher, and the only reason they think that is because they have an attention-seeking disorder. They think the whole thing about being a pastor is you're going to get a lot of attention. No, you're not. Not if you're doing your job. You're going to get a lot of flack. If you're not doing your job, you'll get attention. If you say a lot of stupid stuff, you'll get a lot of stupid people in your church and you'll get all the attention in the world. But it's useless and worthless! And you've fallen into the satanic pattern. Now, of course, again, we've all started with attention-seeking behavior. When we believe in Christ and start growing in grace and knowledge, we get out of that, or we should. And that comes with a personal sense of destiny. You're no longer trying to get attention. What happens when you take attention from attention-seeking behavior to an attention-seeking disorder? Hypochondria. People act sick when they're not sick for attention. Women 
have been known to poison their own children to get attention. That's an attention-seeking disorder. Oh, it's still sin, but they want attention. They say, my child is so sick, and they weep, and they love to hear, uh, the, get the self-pity from other people. It's sick. That's why they call it a disorder. There's, it's not really a disorder. It's part of the old sin nature taken to its extreme. You've just gone deep into the cosmic system and you deserve to be put away by the law if you go that word root. Many women have done that. Can't believe you never heard of it. But that's Satan for you as well. Attention-seeking disorder is what he has. And why not? Many people who have this much beauty and this much attractiveness go in that direction. Marilyn Monroe. She had a very serious problem with attention-seeking behavior. And actually it became an attention-seeking disorder. And why not? She was beautiful. She was always praised. She would show up late on the set and not be criticized. Why? Because she was so beautiful. So they say, I've seen more be I've seen women far more beautiful than her, but she was an icon of the day. And I just use her as an example, not to be judgmental, but just so you can understand that this beauty and this attractiveness, well, oftentimes it leads to that pattern. Now, although Satan is far superior to us in every way, God has provided two factors for us in grace. First of all, he has provided the protection from the laws of divine establishment. Number one, we have protection from the laws of divine establishment. The laws of divine establishment protect our freedom, our freedom to assemble today. They protect our privacy, our privacy to assemble without the police asking, what are you doing? It protects our property so that no thieves are going around stealing things. And it protects life. And not only the life of the believer, but the life of the unbeliever as well. So divine establishment provides protection. Not only from inside threat, but from outside threat. And we're really falling apart in many areas of the laws of divine establishment. And we need this protection. You know, you want to know something about Satan? He despises the laws of divine establishment. He hates them. He has his own system. Socialism. He has his own system. Communism. Laws of divine establishment don't apply to him. He doesn't want marriage. He wants to... Well, he doesn't want marriage. He just wants free love. He doesn't want family. He wants government to take over all children. He doesn't want nationalism. He wants the UN to take over. That covers the four areas of divine institutions. From that spring, divine establishment. So Satan right now is under restraint. And there's a reason why. Satan right now is under restraint. Well, the royal ambassadorship is here. We're ambassadors. We are ambassadors for Christ. And as ambassadors on this earth, we represent Christ to the earth. What is a declaration of war? What is tantamount to a declaration of war? When a nation removes its ambassadors, that means it's time for war. When are Christ ambassadors removed? The resurrection. It's time for war. Well, three and a half years of peace first, but the fact that God recalls all of his ambassadors means, all right, Satan, it's time. It's a declar declaration of warfare. And there will be tremendous warfare and violence, especially the last half of the tribulation. So we have the protect protection of the laws of divine establishment, number one. We have the protection of the divine institutions, number two, and you should know what they are by now. If you don't, you don't really listen at all to anything. Number one, volition. Number two, marriage. Number three, family. Number four, nationalism, all of which was developed in the book of Genesis. Number one, marriage. Genesis, first part of Genesis, chapter three. Or number one's volition. Number two is marriage. Now how did Satan tack volition through marriage? 
That's why I got it mixed up there. But number one, volition. Number two, marriage. Number three, family. Family was attacked. Cain killed Abel. Number four, nationalism. That was attacked, the Tower of Babel. What is the uh, comparable thing to it today? The Tower of Babel, the United Nations. Tower of Babel in the Old Testament. Tower of Babel, United Nations. But that's where the word comes from because they are all babbling in different languages suddenly. And now we try to bring all these languages babbling all together. And guess what? They all believe the same thing. Anti-Semitism and anti-Americanism. And we're a part of that junk. We give money to that junk. Now we give money to terrorists. La-di-da. As if uh, we've lost our minds. We've collectively lost our minds. And why? No spiritual life. No restraint from a pivot. So Satan expresses antagonism, slander, and enemy and enmity toward the following things. This is what we will note before we close the first hour. Satan is the enemy of Israel. Number one, Satan is the enemy of Israel. All anti-Semitism is satanic. Now I'll read you these verses. You won't have to turn there. Revelation 12.4 his tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky, that's a third of the angels, and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. What's all that about? It's referring to Israel. We'll study it more in detail later. But the, the woman is Israel. About to give birth to whom? Jesus Christ. He's also an enemy of Jesus Christ, but he's always going to be an enemy of Israel. Revelation 12, 3. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Who's the woman who gave birth to the male child? Israel. Israel. And many people have confused Revelation 12, 3 and say, oh, that's the church. No, it's not. It's Israel. Revelation 12:15 Then from his mouth the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent Israel The woman refers to Israel There's a lot of symbolism in Revelation So in every generation Satan uses all of his power to destroy Israel In every generation since uh, the Jew was created since Abraham Every generation after Abraham, Satan has used all of his power to destroy Israel. And why has there been such a tremendous rise in anti-Semitism over the last 10 years or 20 years? It was beginning in Europe 20 years ago. But why has there been such a tremendous rise? Satanic influence. Satanic possession of unbelievers as well. So beware of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has destroyed many nations. Many nations that started out great. Many nations that could have lasted for hundreds of years as great, powerful nations. Such as Spain. <coughs> Excuse me. Spain discovered all the gold in the uh, South America. What we call Latin America today. That's where Spain went. And they discovered all of this gold. And they brought all of this gold home. And Spain became extraordinarily wealthy. And the Jewish middle class, actually a Jewish middle class emerged in Spain. And a very wealthy class of Jews emerged in Spain. Because they used that wealth wisely. And then what happened was the Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition, Inquisition called Torquemada. And that was an issue declared by Isabella. I would never be called Isabella in any class. But anyway, Isabella and also her husband started the Spanish Torquemada. And as a result, this was an edict in which all Jews were to be taken out of Spain. Either that, either they had to convert, be burned at the stake, or leave. Many were burned at the stake. They didn't even bother letting them leave. Great anti-Semitism in Spain. What happened shortly thereafter? Well, during this time of prosperity, they built something called the Spanish Armada. The greatest fleet ever seen up until that time. 
a fleet, if I remember correctly, a fleet ten times as large as the British fleet. The British formerly had the greatest fleet. And they decided, as Catholics, they said, we are going to invade England, who at this time had become Protestant and a client nation. Spain had the chance. They were a client nation for a short time, and they lost it to England. Spain became jealous of the British who had welcomed many of those Jews and the British became wealthy and they said we hate those Protestants up there in England we're gonna go up there and we're gonna invade and take it over with our great armada our invincible armada so they went out to sea to invade and the strangest thing happened a storm and this storm wiped them out. And they had to rebuild. And they did rebuild. They were determined. Uh, but by that time they had fallen so far behind. The British whipped them. When the final battle came, the British whipped them. And they did it very easily because the Spanish Armada, they had these huge ships. And the British ships weren't that large. And these huge ships were lined up all the way across the English Channel as far as the eye could see. And these uh, smaller British ships, well, you know what they did to these great big wooden ships that did not have much maneuverability? They just lit them on fire. <laughs> the whole thing burned up. And the Spanish went home with their tail tucked behind their butt. Or how between their legs. That's how you say it. Their tail between their legs. That's where the Spanish went. Why did all that happen? Well, in history, this thing, these things happen because of anti-Semitism. My dad told me I need to edit some of this, but some of it's kind of funny. Tell between but, what is this man saying? But, uh, this is Spain and the Torquemada. And also we have France and the Edict of Nantes, and they went under because of that. So Satan is the enemy of the Jew, the enemy. And he is an anti-Semitic, and this explains a lot of what's going on today. He is also an enemy of all unbelievers. Satan actually is everybody's enemy. He is the believer of all un he is the Satan is the enemy of all unbelievers. He is the greatest deceiver of all time, and he deceives the unbeliever, and he keeps them from believing in Christ through this deception, this great web of deception. Now they've made the choice. Of course, he doesn't keep them fully. There's volition involved. They've chosen to follow Satan, but he has a system that is so entrenched that many unbelievers go this route. Now we'll have a 15 minute break so I can get my marbles back in order and then we will have a, a, a study of, of again the anti-Semitism, how Satan hates unbelievers, how Satan is definitely the enemy of the church, meaning your enemy, how Satan is the enemy of the church age believer, how he has a system of control over people, how he has a control over nations, we will note religion as his satanic strategy. We will note how he uses false teachers. And that will probably be as far as we can get. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we've noted. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.